Do you love the wonderful recap of Oz? I sure hope so. Do you love it so much that you want official Oz recap apparel? Then I have great news for you. I've just opened a Zazzle store where you can buy merchandise inspired by the Oz books. If you're looking for a t-shirt of Glinda the Good reading the Royal Historian's books, or perhaps a pillow depicting our sleepy friends in the poppy field, then look no further. You can find these items and more available at zazzle.com slash store slash Oz recap. Hello everyone, and welcome to the wonderful recap of Oz. My name is Justin Peavy, and I will be reading through L. Frank Baum's novels and diving into a few of the countless film, television, stage, and literary adaptations taking place in the magical land of Oz. On March 30, 1914, the premiere performance of L. Frank Baum's newest stage musical, The Tick-Tock Man of Oz, took place. With music by Louis F. Gottschalk, it was a loose adaptation of his books Ozma of Oz and The Road to Oz. Baum was hoping to make his comeback to the theater scene, and despite a successful summer run and a brief national tour, the producer closed the show. With the cost it took to produce the show, he hoped to end its run while the show was still profitable. Baum took some inspiration from the libretto to write the eighth book in the Oz series. Published in 1914, the book was dedicated to his friend and composer, Louis Gottschalk. A limited amount of material from this musical has survived, but that hasn't prevented any staged readings or revivals produced by the International Wizard of Oz Club. Tick Tock of Oz is also the first book to feature maps of Oz. A map of the Land of Oz could be found on the inside front cover, while the back end papers included a map of the Land of Oz and its surrounding countries including Ev, Vo, and other lands from Baum's books. Although the maps are said to have been illustrated by Professor Wogglebug, they are based on the original sketches and writings of L. Frank Baum. They're in the public domain, and they can be viewed online. In the author's note, Baum reveals that he's received letters from children recommending a crossover with his Sea Fairies and Sky Island books and the Oz books. Apparently, Princess Dorothy told him via wireless telegraph that they already have had adventures with these characters and they can be relayed in another book. Part of me believes this was an idea Baum intended to realize for the eighth book, but spread himself too thin with the musical and was forced to cut corners regarding the plot. Nevertheless, the universe Baum created is continuing to expand, and ambitious, exciting crossovers are on the horizon. There are plenty of new characters introduced in this book, so allow me to tell you the story of Tick Tock of Oz. The kingdom of Oogaboo lies in a far corner in Winky Country and is the smallest and poorest land in all of Oz. In fact, it's so small that it only has a population of 89 citizens in total. It used to be ruled by a king named Joel Jemkif Soforth, who disappeared in an attempt to escape from his disrespectful wife. A few years later, his wife went on a quest to find him, leaving their eldest daughter, Anne Soforth, to act as queen. Her mother and father have not yet returned, perhaps because they found a much nicer place to live. Queen Anne of Oogaboo is an ambitious woman, but she is privileged and universally disliked. When her younger sister Sally refuses to sweep the floor, Anne announces that she is leaving the kingdom. Sally taunts her entitlement by saying Anne should create an army and conquer the land of Oz. Queen Anne, however, takes this idea a bit too seriously. The more she thinks on it, the more she decides that it would be in her best interest to overthrow Ozma in the Emerald City, conquer Oz, and then conquer the world. She finds the only 18 men in her entire country and convinces all but one of them to join her army, which now consists of four generals, four colonels, four majors, four captains, and one private. All of these men have the first name Joe, and their last name is dependent on what the trees in their backyards grow. The private of the army, Joe Files, is a rather bloodthirsty man, and is ready to do the majority of the fighting as necessary to conquer Oz. Joe Files also knows about a gun tree in the land, and travels to pick the largest musket that the tree bears. 
After three days of preparation, the army assembles in front of the royal palace. The women of Ugabu protest that their husbands and fathers are being taken from them, but Anne doesn't care. She orders her citizens to be silent and follows the army's charge as they march out of the land. As we've learned in the past, nothing happens without Glinda the Good knowing about it. Glinda is aware that the army is practically harmless against the combined powers of the wizard, Ozma, and herself, but she still doesn't like the idea of Queen Anne disturbing the peace. So, using her magic, she alters the army's path. Before the queen and her army know it, they've arrived in some territory that separates them from the Land of Oz by an invisible barrier. The path they were following disappears behind them, and they're puzzled at how they could have gotten so lost. And so forth decides to make the best of the situation by conquering the land they've just found themselves in. For three days, they wander the barren land looking for residents or even some source of food. A dark fog starts approaching them, but Private File suggests that it could be the smoky breath of a terrible beast called Rack. The Rack can fly, walk, and swim, has fire burning inside of its body, is larger than a hundred men, and feeds on any living creature. The smoke covers the sky, leaving the Oogabooites in complete darkness. That is, until they see two glowing red eyes. Files makes no hesitation to aim his musket and fire at the beast. The rack is struck by multiple bullets and its body lands on the 16 officers. The rack complains that the bullets have broken his jaw, his left wing, and his right leg. The soldiers free themselves from under the belly of the beast, but the rack begs for them to stay until his jaw heals in an hour so he can eat them. But after learning they have prior engagements, the Rack respects their decision to leave. The Oogabooites escape the Rack in his smoky breath and camp out for the night by a brook. Meanwhile, a young girl named Betsy Bobbin has her ocean voyage interrupted by a terrible storm. When the ship crashes into a rock, the force throws her and a mule named Hank into the sea. Betsy and Hank are able to climb onto a piece of the wreckage and float on the harsh waves for the remainder of the night. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In the morning, Betsy finds that they are drifting towards a beautiful country with several banks of flowers and trees. After washing ashore, Betsy and Hank go to search for some food. They find their way to a greenhouse filled with rose bushes. In the center of each rose, however, is a woman's face, appearing to be asleep. When Hank brays, the roses awaken. They're horrified at the dreadful noise they just heard, but they tell the strangers they've arrived at the Rose Kingdom. Only roses are allowed there, except for the human royal gardener, and if Betsy and Hank stay any longer, the gardener will cast them into the sea. They have no time to flee before the royal gardener appears and announce that they are breaking the law, even if they were shipwrecked against their will. At that moment, a man breaks through the glass roof of the greenhouse and falls to the ground. Betsy goes to greet him, and he introduces himself as Shaggy Man. He was picking an apple from a tree when the branch gave way, causing him to crash through the ceiling. The royal gardener demands that the intruders be put to death. Hank kicks the gardener, causing him to fly out of the greenhouse, and buys some time for Betsy and Shaggy to figure out what to do. The author now refers to the Shaggy man simply as Shaggy, so I'll do the same. Shaggy says that he's borrowed the love magnet from the Emerald City, so he is sure he can convince the gardener to set them free. Despite being from Oklahoma, Betsy knows all about the Land of Oz for some reason. When asking why Shaggy would ever leave the beautiful land of Oz, he reveals that he is on a mission to find his younger brother, who has been lost for ten years. His brother was a gold miner in Colorado, and one day, he went into a mine and disappeared. Shaggy presumes the Gnome King captured him, so he's on his way to the land of Ev to find him. Shaggy explains that since the Gnome King forgot his own name in Book 6, he now goes by Ruggedo, or the Metal Monarch. At that moment, the royal gardener returns, but Shaggy waves the magnet and the gardener throws himself at Shaggy's feet. He expresses his love for the Shaggy man, but says he must leave before he's forced to be put to death. Betsy explains that no ruler has condemned them yet, but the gardener reveals they are still waiting for their next ruler to ripen. The gardener brings his guests to the royal bushes at their request. In this garden, they see several members of the royal family growing from bushes. Upon their arrival, they see a royal princess that has ripened. The gardener reveals that her name is Ozga, a distant cousin of Ozma of Oz, but he refuses to pick her because the people in the Rose Kingdom will not have a female ruler. While the gardener's back is turned, Betsy and Shaggy pick the princess from the rose bush. I swear I've seen this somewhere before. 
Princess Ozga thanks her rescuers, but they are immediately met with hostility from the gardener and the roses. Ozga is pretty upset that her subjects deny her, and the fact that she was picked by mortals without the roses' consent means she must be banished from the kingdom. The roses all gather together and force the intruders out of the kingdom. Now that they've been cast out, Betsy offers to help Shaggy look for his brother, and also volunteers Hank to help. It seems as if Betsy has no issues with the fact that she is shipwrecked and away from home, but she would much rather be going on adventures anyway. Princess Ozga also decides to go with Shaggy since she has been exiled from her home. Elsewhere, Polychrome is dancing with her sisters, the fellow daughters of the rainbow. They made their way down the rainbow's arch and danced on the ground. All of the sisters but Polychrome make it back onto the rainbow before it disappears. Polychrome is once again stuck on the earth with no way to get home. Betsy Bobbin, Hank, Princess Ozga, and the Shaggy Man arrive just as Polychrome begins to cry. At the sight of the love magnet, she becomes much warmer towards the Shaggy Man, which is strange because you'd think she'd be more friendly with him after their adventures together in Book 5. She learns of their plans to visit Ruggedo and is sure they will need as much help as they can get, so she agrees to help them find his palace. After camping out for the night by a brook, they follow a faint trail to an old well. They are disappointed that the well has dried up and therefore can't quench any thirst, but Hank sees something at the bottom. Using the windlass, they uncover lots of junk that people had thrown into the well. However, the last thing they pull out of the well is a large man made entirely out of copper. Shaggy immediately recognizes him, Betsy reads the man's engravings with his instructions, and they wind him up. This is when Shaggy formally introduces his friend, TikTok. TikTok reveals that after Shaggy started on his adventure, Ozma had seen his brother in the Gnome King's cavern. So, TikTok was transported to the Land of Ev by Glinda the Good so he could tell Shaggy where his brother was. However, he encountered the Gnome King on the way, who threw him down into the well in rage. As they deliberate where to go next, they see an army coming towards them. The army of Oogaboo approaches and are frightened by the appearances of TikTok and Shaggy. Everyone introduces themselves, but Queen Anne delivers the news that she is conquering the land and everyone in it. However, Private Files refuses to arrest the prisoners because it would be impolite to do so, and he resigns his position. Queen Anne is about to order her officers to imprison Files when Shaggy waves the love magnet and everyone immediately forgets any ill will they wish towards each other. Using his newfound charm, Shaggy says they should redirect their focus to conquering the Gnome King, who owns all precious metals underground. This pleases Anne and her army, so they happily agree. However, since Private Files has resigned his position, Queen Anne must find a new private. They ultimately elect TikTok to do so, since his copper body can sustain more damage than the other officers. Now they must figure out the way to the Gnome King's cavern, and Princess Ozga decides to ask some flowers in a field. At once, they lean towards the direction of the Kingdom of Ruggedo, and they start on their way. The Gnome King, who seems to have regained his memory, has the instinct that people are searching for his kingdom. He summons his High Chamberlain, Coleco, who looks at a magic spyglass to survey the area. Lo and behold, the Gnome King's suspicions are confirmed. The only familiar face that is approaching is TikTok, but as he is not accompanied by Ozma and Dorothy, Ruggedo is not deterred by this news he is certain his army can easily destroy them. As the travelers approach the rubber country, the Gnome King orders Coleco to make the rubber path more difficult to tread along. When TikTok and his friends arrive at a stream, he steps onto a rubber stepping stone and is launched into the air. Some of the other generals meet the same fate, but their companions find joy in being able to bounce higher and higher into the air. Some of them elect to bounce on the stones until they reach solid ground beyond the stream while some elect to walk through the brook made of dry water. Dry water, of course, leaving whatever it touches perfectly dry. Regardless, they safely escape Coleco's rubber tricks. An infuriated Gnome King decides that they should be thrown into the hollow tube. Coleco protests, explaining that someone named Tiriti Huchu, who lives on the other side of the world, would be angry with his action. Coleco then summons a gnome with enormous ears, called the Long-Eared Hearer, to listen and see what the travelers seek. Upon learning that they're searching for the Shaggy Man's brother, whom the Gnome King refers to as the Ugly One, Ruggedo reveals that he has been sent to the Metal Forest to live in isolation. They also learn that the army of Ugubu intends to conquer the Gnomes, which infuriates the King and solidifies his decision to throw them into the Hollow Tube. 
He orders his chief magician to make the tube's entrance invisible and to alter the path to trap them. The trap works, because TikTok, Queen Anne, Shaggy, Betsy, Hank, Polychrome, and the army of Oogaboo fall into the tube, encapsulated by darkness and sliding along a steep incline. It is longer than an hour before they see daylight again. They fall out of the tube and land on the ground nearby, except for TikTok, who lands in a water fountain. This sparks the attention of a peculiar, multicolored person called Tubekins. Polychrome announces that Ruggedo must have thrown them unlawfully into the tube, which excites Tubekins. He speaks to some unseen people, saying they must bring the group of strangers to visit the private citizen. After helping TikTok out of the fountain and oiling his clockwork, Tubekins and the invisible people bring their visitors to a chamber they refer to as the residence. Once they are inside, they stand before a throne and hear a bell being tolled. Instantly, hundreds of people appear surrounding them, with elegant clothes and strikingly similar resemblances to Tubekins. It is explained that they are all kings and queens, but their supreme ruler is a private citizen. The bell rings again, and the private citizen appears in the throne. The private citizen, also known as Tiriti Huchu, the great Jinjin, only chooses to speak with the leader of their party. In this case, it appears to be TikTok. The copper man relays their story and their intentions to conquer the Gnome King and, since Ruggedo unlawfully threw them into the tube, the private citizen decides the Metal Monarch must be punished. It is decreed that their guests will be given accommodations for the night, and they will return to the residence tomorrow for further instructions. The Jinjin and the majority of the kings and queens disappear, except for a few. The group is divided amongst these people, Betsy and Polychrome becoming the guests of Irma, the Queen of Light. In Irma's palace, they meet six lovely maidens, Sunlight, Moonlight, Starlight, Daylight, Firelight, and Electra. Queen Irma tells her guests about this beautiful land of fairies who administer the needs of mankind. Betsy inquires about the dragon head that is embroidered on all of their gowns. Irma answers that the dragon is the first living creature to ever exist, and the original dragon still lives. He has many descendants and he is very wise. The dragon's head on their gowns show that they are the favorite inhabitants of the land, and they honor the dragon ancestor. After enjoying a large feast, Betsy is shown to a bedchamber where she quickly falls asleep. The next morning, everyone meets again at the residence of Tiriti Huchu. He declares that the strangers must return through the tube to the other side of the world and sent with an immature dragon named Quox, who will drive the Gnome King out of his palace and take away his magical powers. Tubekins brings our friends to the tube as they wait for Quox to arrive. Just then, a large dragon appears with a sky-blue body and silver scales. He is also wearing a pink ribbon and a chain of pearls with a golden locket attached. He also has an electric light attached to his tail, and the Jinjin use his magic to attach 24 seats to the dragon's back. Hank, Betsy, Shaggy, Polychrome, Files, Asuka, Queen Anne, TikTok, and the officers all bore the dragon's back just before it slides into the tube. I am thrilled to announce that the wonderful Recap of Oz will now be hosted by The Oz Connection, the official YouTube channel for OzCon International. The Oz Connection is your place to watch and listen to diverse Oz content produced by Oz fans for Oz fans. From the famous 40 Oz books to MGM's The Wizard of Oz, Disney's Return to Oz, and so much more. So be sure to like and subscribe to receive regular updates from The Oz Connection. OzCon was established in 1964 and now occurs annually on the West Coast. For more information, you can visit OzConInternational.com. Hi, I'm Karen. And I'm Colleen. And this is Books, Movies, and Musicals. Oh Oh my. my. Come join us as we discuss our favorite childhood stories in analytical and honest ways. Most recently, we've been discussing Harry Potter and Disney princesses. We have so many more ideas and we can't wait to go through them with you. So keep it magical. And leave a little magic wherever you go. Bye. The long-eared hearer alerts the Gnome King to the fact that our protagonists are making their way back through the hollow tube. 
Ruggedo is confident they will successfully find their way to his kingdom, and as they don't have eggs this time around, he prepares for their return. Coleco summons General Guff and the Gnome army, and they are ordered to march to the mouth of the tube and await their return. While Shaggy and Betsy debate how they're able to fall in both directions, Quox launches out of the tube, sailing a hundred feet over the Gnome army and landing on the peak of a mountain. His passengers disembark, and the seats on Quox's back disappear. An angry General Guff calls to them from the bottom of the mountain. The gnomes throw their spears, but they bounce off of the dragon's tough body. The Oogaboo army then marches towards the gnomes, but the gnomes flee in terror. Queen Anne decides they should force their way into the gnome kingdom and conquer it, and Quox decides to stay behind and rest. Anne is confident that her army is invincible without him, but nobody dares to argue with someone as stubborn as Queen Anne on this matter. TikTok leads the Oogaboo army to the entrance of the cavern. The Gnome King knew they were coming, so he opened up a deep pit just at the entrance. TikTok avoids the pit, but Queen Anne and the rest of the army fall into Ruggedo's trap. TikTok is forced to face the Gnome King alone. While he attempts to conquer the gnomes, Betsy grows impatient waiting for something to happen, so she quietly rides Hank into the cavern, which angers Ruggedo. Betsy asks if the kingdom has been conquered yet. The king says no. Betsy then asks for something to eat, which the king doesn't respond too kindly to. Betsy then shows the king that she is a fearless child, scolding him for threatening to starve her. The Gnome King is impressed by her insistence, so he takes her order. When she mentions hard-boiled eggs, he loses his cool. He orders Guff to seize Betsy and lock her in the slimy cave. Coleco kicks TikTok over while Hank kicks Guff away. A heavy diamond is then placed on TikTok's body so he can't move, and his gun is seized. Coleco then grabs Betsy and whispers in her ear that, if she goes with him, he will save her. She plays along, pretending she has been captured until Coleco guides her to his own room. He promises that she will be safe there, coordinates a secret knock, and then leaves to get her some food. Meanwhile in the pit, Queen Anne and her army discover a secret passage. She leads her army through the opening in the hopes of escaping. Outside the cavern, Polychrome, Shaggy, Files, and the Rose Princess wait for the successful conquest of the gnomes. In case their mission is failing, Shaggy is certain that the love magnet will make the process go a lot quicker. Unfortunately, his speech is overheard by the long-eared hearer, who immediately informs the king of the charm he possesses. Shaggy decides to go into the cavern to check the progress, followed by Files and Asuka. As soon as he enters, the gnomes tie him up with ropes, preventing him from getting the love magnet in his pocket. Files and Asuka are then shackled with golden handcuffs. Polychrome sees this happen from afar and tries to wake up the sleeping dragon. When Quox doesn't wake up, Polychrome is forced to take matters into her own hands. She rushes into the cavern and the gnome king takes a liking to her. So he makes a deal with her. If Polychrome agrees to live there with him, he will free all of her friends. She declines his kind offer, so the king orders General Guff to capture her. Polychrome, being a fairy, is able to materialize and dematerialize as she pleases, teleporting around the room and escaping Guff. Coleco is ordered to summon the executioners and makes them fetch the army of Oogaboo, Queen Anne, Betsy Bobbin, and Hank. None of them can be found, so Ruggedo decides to focus on the successful captures before his throne. The Gnome King uses a magic spell to transform the Shaggy Man into a dove. Polychrome realizes she needs to be a bit more proactive in defending her friends, so she runs out to try and wake up the dragon again. By yanking Quox's pearl necklace, Polychrome is able to wake up the beast. He makes his way into the cavern and is promptly chained and captured. They find that the Gnome King transformed Asuka into a fiddle and is about to transform Files into a fiddle bow. Quox is taunted by the king before he announces that the pink ribbon he wears has been enchanted by Tiriti Huchu to take the Gnome King's magic. Ruggedo calls his bluff, but the spell to transform files doesn't work. Quox delivers the Jinjin's commands, which forces Ruggedo out of his kingdom and onto the Earth's surface to roam aimlessly. He is, of course, allowed to take as many riches in his pockets as he can fit, but nothing else. The Gnome King is intimidated, but insists that he will not go. So the dragon opens his locket and six eggs roll upon the floor. The gnomes flee and King Ruggedo tries to escape from the eggs, but they've been enchanted to follow him wherever he goes. It becomes too much for him to bear, and he runs out of his palace. 
The eggs stop following him at the entrance, but they do stand guard there in case the Metal Monarch dares to return. The former Gnome King now is nothing more than a wanderer, who didn't even get the opportunity to fill his pockets with jewels before he fled. By simply brushing the dove and the fiddle against Quox's pink ribbon, they are restored to their true forms, Shaggy and Ozga. The diamond is taken off of TikTok and Quox busts out of his chains, which he had the ability to do earlier but chose not to. Coleco goes to his private chambers to bring back Betsy and Hank. Upon his return, Quox crowns Coleco as the new Gnome King. Once this is done, the focus shifts on freeing Shaggy's brother, the Ugly One. Coleco tells him about the Metal Forest, which serves as a treasury, filled with trees made of gold and silver, and with the ground strewn with precious stones. He is discouraged that they won't be able to find the way, because Ruggedo changes the location of the forest weekly. They also wonder what's become of Queen Anne and the Oogaboos, but conclude that they won't be able to find them by staying put. Coleco then assembles a few gnomes to act as a search party for the Metal Forest. That night, Betsy, Hank, Shaggy, Ozga, Files, and Polychrome are housed in the Gnome Kingdom, while Quox decides to sleep outside. The following day, Quox bids everyone goodbye and slides back into the hollow tube, starting his journey home. After three days, the search for the Metal Forest seems futile. That is, until Polychrome spots Ruggedo on a nearby mountain. He has decided to go into the Metal Forest to claim some jewels, since the eggs are still guarding the cavern. So he opens a secret passage in the mountain and disappears inside of it. Polychrome watches all of this unfold and immediately alerts her companions. Within an hour, they are in the tunnel that leads to the Metal Forest. After a long distance, they arrive at the treasury and marvel at its beauty. They begin to search through the forest, where the Ugly One has been held prisoner for up to three years. Soon they hear a scream, followed by a loud voice crying, Halt! They rush to the scene and find Ruggedo, captured by Queen Anne and the Oogaboo army. It turns out the passage they found in the Gnome King's pit led directly to the Metal Forest. They wandered the forest for days until Ruggedo appeared. Upon hearing that Ruggedo has been dethroned, the Oogaboos free him. Ruggedo explains that he is only fulfilling the promise that was made by Tititi Huchu, allowing him to take as many riches as he could before his exile. He gathers as many jewels as he can and stuffs them in his pockets. The weight of the mall restricts his movement, but he amicably leaves the forest when he collects his riches. Shaggy asks Queen Anne about his brother, and she reveals that they've only seen one other person in the forest, but he flees whenever he is approached. They find a small hut constructed using twigs and branches, and Shaggy calls out to his brother. The Ugly One responds from inside, saying he was transformed upon his capture. When he first came into Ruggedo's custody, he was very handsome, but the former king found it humorous to strip him of his good looks and make him the homeliest man who has ever lived. He is so ashamed of his looks that he refuses to see his brother. Betsy offers a handkerchief, so the Ugly One can use it as a mask. The Ugly One cuts holes for his eyes and nose into the cloth and then ties it over his face. Finally, he emerges from the hut and reunites with his brother. He is introduced to Shaggy's companions, but he remains apprehensive to return to the world without a way to reverse the spell. Everyone leaves the Metal Forest to find a trail of jewels on the ground. They follow it and find Ruggedo. The weight of the jewels had become too much for him to bear, so he emptied his pockets one by one as he wandered away. When he sees the Ugly One, he is regretful of the cruel trick he played on him. He would reverse the spell if he could, but his powers are gone. He does recollect, however, that a kiss will break the charm, but he can't remember if it has to be a kiss from a mortal maid, a fairy, or a mortal maid who was once a fairy. Mortal maid Betsy kisses the ugly one on the cheek, but it doesn't work. Mortal maid who was once a fairy, Princess Ozga, then kisses him with no success. Then fairy Polychrome kisses his cheek, which succeeds in altering his appearance. Even Ruggedo remarks that his new face is an improvement. Everyone, including Ruggedo, travels back to the Gnome King's cavern. The eggs have disappeared, so Ruggedo trails behind everyone else. The former king, now a friendless and pathetic shell of what he used to be, garners sympathy from Betsy. When Coleco serves everyone dinner, Betsy brings some food and drink over to Ruggedo, and his eyes fill with tears at this unexpected gesture of kindness. He sincerely apologizes to everyone for the harm he's done, and Coleco has mercy on him. He decides to allow Ruggedo to stay in the cavern as long as he is well-behaved, and Ruggedo promises not to cause any more problems. As it begins to rain, Polychroma waits for a rainbow to appear. 
Once it does, she runs on the arch and is embraced by her sisters. They all shout goodbye to her friends, who have treated her so kindly in her time of need, and the rainbow melts into the sky. Meanwhile, in the Emerald City, Ozma has been watching everything happen through her magic picture. She has the wizard send Queen Anne, Princess Ozga, and the Ugubu army back to their homes. Their sudden disappearance from the Gnome King's cavern alerts everyone, so Ozma promptly calls Shaggy on a rather magical device invented by the wizard, a wireless telephone. Ozma tells Shaggy what he's done, and he tells her she must teleport TikTok back to the land of Oz. For himself, however, Shaggy has decided to exile himself from Oz. Rather than returning home and abandoning Betsy, Hank, and his brother, he decides to stay in the land of Ev. TikTok disappears while Shaggy, Betsy, Hank, and Shaggy's brother decide to embark on some new adventures. Back in Oz, a meeting is held with the wizard, TikTok, and Princess Ozma to discuss what to do about the Shaggy Man's departure. They send for Dorothy, informing her of the dilemma. Ozma is hesitant to allow any new mortals into Oz, but after some deliberation, she is swayed to ask the wizard to transport them all to the Emerald City. After the wizard performs a spell taught to him by Glinda the Good, Jellia Jam announces the arrival of the newest citizens of Oz. Shaggy cries tears of joy as he and his brother are sent for. Meanwhile, Dorothy decides to meet Betsy and Hank herself. Hank becomes acquainted with the Sawhorse, the Cowardly Lion, and the Hungry Tiger. They ask if hee-haw is all he knows how to say, and Hank is surprised by a newfound ability to speak perfect English. The sawhorse explains he can talk now because he's in the land of Oz. Ozma, Dorothy, and Betsy arrive at the stables as they get into a heated discussion regarding their loyalties to their masters. Despite their disagreements, they respect each other's differing opinions and become friends. Betsy asks Dorothy if all the animals in Oz talk, and she says all of them can, except for Toto. Dorothy assumes that it's because he's from the United States, but Ozma brings up that Belina isn't a native of Oz either, which makes Dorothy question her dog's honesty. She uses a whistle to summon Toto and begins to interrogate him. He only speaks and barks. That is, until she begs him to say just one word and prove he can talk. Toto hesitates, before saying, All right, here I go, and promptly running away. Shaggy's brother tells Ozma how happy he is to live in such a delightful place as Oz, but she says it is thanks to the Shaggy Man that he's there in the first place. Betsy wishes that every child could live in the land of Oz, and Ozma laughs at this, telling Betsy they're fortunate not to have to worry about overpopulation. Well, Toto talks, I guess. I wonder why he hasn't, and I'm curious to know if he'll be more vocal in the future. And sure, Dorothy is delighted to know her dog can speak, but personally, I feel like it's too little too late. That sounds harsh because I know I've been really hoping to have some sort of answer here, but personally, I just don't feel fulfilled by this detail. There is still a glaring continuity error. There's the fact that the majority of this book takes place in the land of Ev, and Hank couldn't speak. But when Belina and Dorothy arrived there in book three, the hen had no issue talking with any given opportunity. I appreciate Baum trying to get the continuity back on track, but my nitpicky brain just can't get past the overseen details. This book had some fun elements to it. For example, this is the first book that uses alliteration in its chapter titles. Some of my favorites include TikTok Tackles a Tough Task, The Roses Repulse the Refugees, and The Naughty Gnome. I enjoyed the author's anti-war commentary, depicted through the Ugabu army's unwillingness to fight, as well as the soldiers preferring official titles over actual combat. My favorite part was definitely when the Gnome King was forced to leave all of his riches behind. I think that imagery is very powerful. I know he's a villain, but he has some valid justifications, specifically his anger when people steal the precious jewels made by the Gnomes. To see a dethroned king desperately clinging to his riches and finding himself in the position that he's too weighed down by them, I love that. I do wonder how the Gnome King learned some of those magic spells, though, because I was under the impression that he was powerless without his magic belt. There is a point in this book, after they've rescued the Ugly One, where it's revealed he survived by eating three coarse nuts which grow on trees. These large hollow nuts contain three coarse meals, which sounds a lot like the lunch pail trees. Sure, they're back in the land of Ev where the lunch pail trees originate, But this book seems like a really layered rehash of Ozma of Oz, with dashes of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz, and the Road to Oz. We've got lunch on trees, 
a shipwrecked little girl from Tornado Alley, washing onto the shores of the land of Ev, the discovery of TikTok, an army of mainly officers, the presence of the Gnome King, and using eggs to save the day. I'm sure I'm forgetting some commonalities, but these are the ones that stuck out the most to me. Now, I think because of its derivativeness, this definitely wasn't my favorite book. I'm hoping for more opportunities for the newer characters to come back, because we didn't see any of the characters introduced in Book 7 in this installment. Well, my favorite quotes from Book 8 are as follows. A hamburger steak is a hamburger steak, whether it is live or not. Said by Colonel Banjo. One who is master of himself is always a king, if only to himself. One can be ugly in looks, but lovely in disposition. Said by Polychrome. Jewels and gold are cold and heartless things. Said by the ugly one. Thank you again for listening in. If you have any interest in supporting the podcast, you can visit anchor.fm slash ozrecap. I hope to create some video companions to some of these episodes in the future, and becoming a supporter would help me better create content for my fellow Oz fans. If you are interested in reading the Oz series along with me, all of Baum's novels are in the public domain and available online for free. They're easy to read, and the illustrations alone are so interesting to behold. You are now all members of my Oz book club. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Well, that's all I've got. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Oz Recap for updates and more Oz content. Until next time, I'm Justin, and this has been the wonderful recap of Oz. Oz.